shall we start? Sure. Good evening, everybody. Hello, over there and around the various screens, dear students, alumni, colleagues, friends and comrades. Good evening, good afternoon and good morning. Our heartfelt welcome to our second public seminar of the CCCRP study program of the Visual Arts Department at Head de Genève during the academic year 2020-21. Thank you so much, dear Nonsi Kilelu Mutiti, joining us tonight. And for you, it's in the middle of the day from Richmond in Virginia. And also thank you so much, dear Dr. Coach Ashun, joining us from Berlin, but also for inviting Nancy in the first place to this session of the public seminar. We are joined by many students of uh, currently studying at the CCC, but also friends, partners, and alumni in Geneva, Moscow, Richmond, Berlin, maybe London, and further places. It's a great pleasure to have you all on board. We are greeting you from the public seminar wherever you are in this world that still is and is again in a catastrophic turbulence from this planetary pandemic crisis in which the pathogen agent called SARS-CoV-2 only amplifies ongoing existing systems of violence, social injustice, racial global capitalism and the health access inequality. We do hope that this moment of our live stream finds you safe and sound, or that this live stream data transmission in real time brings our voices and sounds and images as good spirits to your bodies, to your eyes and your ears, and to make you feel to be part of a community that cares as much as we can as a study program to recover from COVID plus. For those who don't know, um, my name is Doreen Mender. I'm responsible of the CCCRP. These five letters stand for Critical Curatorial Cybernetic Research Practices, yet we can extend the C into further horizons such as contemporary, cosmic, or psychopathic. The CCC is one of three master programs of the Visual Arts Department at Genève, and we are specialized in developing and rehearsing and materializing project situated research methodologies by the means of contemporary art towards the articulation of advanced practices as a network of practices in making and thinking art. Each year, the CCC, the public seminar, is conceptualized by a particular approach for discussion. In 2020-21, the approach is defined by the theory fiction seminar that is led by Dr. Kochi Ashun, and that engages with science fiction, cosmologies, technogenesis, spirituality, black ontologies, and alienation as artistic curatorial urgencies. In the pre-COVID world, which sounds like light years away from us these days, yet let's remind ourselves of this epoch where we could share an intimacy of thinking together. The public seminar took place at the Salvon Set um, 27 of the Visual Arts Department um, on the Boulevard Elvetique Number no. 9 in Geneva and Switzerland. Students, guests, and friends would all gather around our large seminar table, closely next to each other, forming a vivid social fabric of biographies of research in order to listen, to wonder, to debate, to disagree, and agree to learn together, to struggle, to unlearn, and to think with a specific thought and or a research study that a theorist, an artist, or a curator generously presented to us, presents to us. At our research-based program, we do not separate between theory and practice. Specifically in a time such as this one, we need theory more than ever as a tool, as an ally, an action, a friend, a concept, or a companion to train ourselves to think and to think differently in order to make a world that we want to be part of. Today is Monday, the 7th of December, 2020. 
I am speaking from the time zone called Heure Normale d'Europe Centrale or European Central Time ECT or 7 p.m. It is an immense pleasure to welcome tonight to this session the artist, designer and educator Nonzi Kilelo Mutiti from Richmond speaking into this time zone as well as geography who has been invited by Coach Reaction into this session entitled Inf In Infinite Iteration. Coach will introduce Nancy in a second. Please allow me to very briefly introduce Coach first, who is many of you know, but also some might not know. That's the reason I share this with you, um, just really to open up also the frame. Coach Ashen is a filmmaker, an artist, and a theorist who is currently teaching the theory fiction seminar at the CCCRP of the Visual Arts Department at Hatchenet. Coach also co-directs the Visual Cultures PhD seminar at Goldsmiths University of London. Coach Ashen is co-founder of the Autolit Group, whose works explores the interscala convergence of racial capitalism and the Capitalocene. And the Ozolib group has the uh, traveling exhibition Xenogenesis that is on display, at the, has been on display at the ICA in Richmond. Uh, and I think this was also a very important encounter between Culture and Nancy that also has been leading to this evening today. And um, the exhibition is continuous to travel elsewhere, like in Dublin, Ljubljana, and Sharjah. So before I hand over to Kocho, and much looking forward to the session with Nancy uh, of uh, Infinite Iteration, please just allow me to sketch out very briefly some Zoom specific points. You are more than welcome to share your questions already in the chat during the presentation by Nancy. Um, for the sake of keeping a bit the conversation in time, we are happy to read your questions from the chat, uh, or also if you have microphone problems, of course. But I think we also might be not such a large group, we also might be able to open up, you know, uh, the microphone and the screen. Please close your camera and your microphone during the presentation of uh, of um, Nancy that will take about 30 minutes and with a subsequent conversation with Kojo as well as the students, the attendees, um, that Kojo will moderate the conversation. We will record this session for the sake of archiving it and if you also agree we want to share this on the CCCRP YouTube channel and let us know if you don't feel comfortable with then we find the solution um, otherwise. And uh, also last but not least at all, thank you dear Nayan Sagamov and Kolo, as well as Julie Marmé, for the technical and spiritual support to operate the various platforms for this evening. And dear Kojo, the screen is yours. Dear Nancy, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doreen. Um, thank you, Nayan Saku. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to... Um, everybody at CCC for making this possible for uh, a techno literate like myself. It's actually essential to have allies to make these things happen. So thank you for that. Um, actually, the event is going to be a conversation in which we kind of, uh, in which Nancy and I will have a dialogue around points of her work. Um, because there is there is so much work that Nancy has engaged in over the last few years. Uh, we thought it'd be kind of generative to touch base with some specific moments. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome Nancy Kalela Mutiti to the public seminar at CCC. Um, uh, her friends call her Nancy, so I'm going to take the liberty of calling Nancy Kalela Nancy from now on. As Doreen pointed out, we met at the ICA at the VCU in the spring of 2020. That's the Institute, of Contem Institute for Contemporary Art at Virginia Commonwealth University. In the spring of this year, this exceedingly exorbitantly long year, um, when um, the exhibition that I participate in, Xenogenesis, um, was presented at ICU, ICA. And you can see the uh, image behind me that's that big wall that you see with Octavia Butler staring at you that's one side of the ICA at VCU 
So Nancy uh, conceived uh, the public programs within that context. And it's in that context that I met uh, Nancy. After the opening, we began a conversation around what we could call the speculative vectors of neo-Africanist aesthetics. That's to say what and how we could think of the past, present and futurity and virtuality of neo-Africanist aesthetics. Um, so we stayed up talking about Shabazz Palaces, who Nancy is good friends with, um, with Io of the New York based group Yapo Repository, who's going to be our next guest. We talked about Chino Mobi, Nancy's student, who will be the guest after that. So you can see what an effect this single evening had on my thinking, because it effectively provided the germ for this entire series. So Nancy Mituti is a Zimbabwean born interdisciplinary artist, graphic designer and educator who studied multimedia art at Zimbabwe Institute of Digital Arts or Ziva in Harare and graphic design at the Yale School of Art in New Haven, Connecticut. Nancy is currently assistant professor in graphic design at VCU and we will be an artist in residence at the DAAD program in Berlin in 2021. Nancy's practice traverses the boundaries of fine arts, design, and public engagement. She is concerned with the forms of print and the implications of publication as a time based medium. Nancy's many graphic design projects include the printed matter for Simone Lee's The Waiting Room at the New Museum in 2016, Asiko on the Future of Artistic and Curatorial Pedagogies in Africa edited by the great DC Silva for the Center for Contemporary Art in Lagos in 2017. Strange Attractors published on the occasion of the 10th Berlin Biennial for Contemporary Art in 2018. And The Anarchy of Colored Girls Assembled in a Riotous Manner, published on the occasion of Simone Lee's landmark solo exhibition, Loophole of Retreat at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York in 2019. Along with the literary researcher Tinashi Mushakavani, Nancy is art director and publication manager of Black Chalk and Co, which he co-founded with Mushakavani in 2015. Black Chalk and Co is a non-profit publisher that manifests in alternative archives, publications and events that experiments with formats and designs that include zines, maps, art portfolios, podcasts, films, postcards, posters, and alternative textbooks. It's a project which resonates with the work of groups such as the Cape Town-based Chimarenga and the Johannesburg-based Keller-Ketlin Library, if you know those projects, and you should. In 2019, Black Chalk and Co. published Dedication for Yvonne Vera, which accompanied A Woman for Bulawayo, Yvonne Vera the Gallerist, for 154, Contemporary African Art Fair in New York, the first publication to attend to the artistic career of the great Zimbabwean avant-garde novelist Yvonne Vera. In 2019, Black Chalk and Co. co-edited and published Some Writers Can Give You Two Heartbeats, a book that emerges from and is engendered by what Mutiti calls the event of reading, writing, publishing, and the collective conversation that grows out of it. A meditation on literary criticism, a new form of expository homage, an extended conversation that brings writers from different generations and backgrounds together for the first time, a transgenerational gathering of Zimbabwe's literary avant-garde assembled to discuss, dispute, debate, and disagree on methods of writing. Some writers can give you two heartbeats, can be read as a companion to readingzimbabwe.com, which is described by Nancy as the constellation of works about the polyvocal figure of Zimbabwe, as written in print for the past six decades. As an interdisciplinary artist, Matuti's recent exhibitions include three on visibility and camouflage, 
Works from Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter. Created by Daniela Rose King in 2017 in Brooklyn. Everything is Where It Is, Expected, a solo exhibition of Printed Matter, Inc. in New York in 2019. And the group exhibition surfacing at Mono Practice in Baltimore. And upcoming is a major mural project in four cities, which hopefully we'll have time to get to. So you'll notice that this introduction has focused on non seized publications and collaborations, precisely because these will not provide the focus for our conversation. And not because they are not important, quite, in, quite the contrary, because as one of the most important designers of her generation, such work deserves its own sem seminar in its own right. Because we do not believe in attempting to survey an entire ongoing artistic career in one occasion, we're going to focus our discussion around a cross section of Nancy's projects. I do not wish to merely introduce these projects, but to actually engage with them in order to enter into a more spacious, more capacious, more elaborated and less constrained dialogue around Monty's thinking, Monty's research, Monty's projects. Our plan is to think together on the technological aesthetics, aesthetic technologies and aesthetic socialities of Monty's interdisciplinary methodologies. We hope that this is generative for all practitioners based at the CCC, embarked upon research-based practice, and that it is usable and thinkable for our guests. So that was the long introduction. Take a deep breath. <sighs> okay, let's start. Let's set the scene. We are in Yale Library. Nancy is attending the Yale School of Art. Having moved from Harare to Yale, New Haven, Connecticut, for her MFA program. And uh, as we discussed, Nancy, uh, there's a book that has been important for your thinking, for your research and for your practice a book entitled Traditional Hairstyles for the Black Woman by Kunle Sonuga, a book from 1976. Can you tell us a bit about this book? Maybe show us a few scenes and in a way, uh, give us an insight into your thinking at this time and why this book acted as a kind of set of implied and implicit methods for research, theory, practice, and futurity. Thank you so much, Kodron, and thank you, Doreen, as well, um, for, you know, in space for this conversation. Um, you know, definitely the work of publishing, you know, has a special place in my practice, but I also think that considering what the book has done for my practice, I think about what publications I look at, what I collect, um, what's happening within the sequence of the spreads of you know the things I choose to really concentrate on has been so um, has really given me a, a very interesting grounding you know to think about what the book does as a frame you know and I think this is uh, what our conversation will also point out like um, the book as a device and a tool uh, and a framework for seeing and. Uh, language, visual language um, as uh, something that is, uh, can be reduced to a module and continue to build meaning. And this publication, I mean, one of the most beautiful uh, texts I've ever encountered, um, really self-produced uh, by a Ghanaian um, uh, individual, you know, typeset and designed and photographed by, by himself uh, in collaboration with another individual who helped with the, the layout. But, um, you know, the idea of hairdressing for me has always been uh, kind of akin to a design practice. It's a, um, it's a rule-based, tool-based practice and it's in service of other people. It's, it's about attending and care 
and there's a lot of communication that you know we we, we consider when we're involved in, in both. Um, and this is a page, and I'll show it more. Um, you know, just more clearly when I go to the slideshow. But um, I just thought it was important to think about what this book is doing in terms of creating these like really intense borders, these very very um, uh, prominent frames around the figure, and what the book does in terms of giving us a, a kind of 360 view, you know, and, and also a view of people within context, um, you know, something that the book does when it creates a subject is takes, takes it out of context or builds a context from a particular perspective, the author's perspective. And here definitely Sunoga is, you know, the author, he is in the space with his eye. He's documenting his wife, his, uh, his, <laughs> his sisters-in-law, um, women within his community. And he, he is, he is documented from within and also from around. I just find that this way of thinking about the eye as not necessarily looking, you know, well, in a way he's kind of really acknowledging the idea of the camera and the idea of, of cinema, like a cinematic kind of way of thinking about these women in space, in time and in community. I, I also love this um, page, which kind of brings him into a film strip, you know. Um, the way that he documents these women also, I feel, kind of uh, elevates what um, what we think about the idea of hairdressing. It kind of makes them monumental. Uh, something that we talked about uh, when I was telling Kurt about encountering this publication was what led me to find it. I didn't know about this book. I was looking for something else. I had just learned about JD or J. Curry's photographs. I wasn't necessarily interested in braiding, but I was trying to think about artists that were using technologies and how to talk about the use of technology in the work without just thinking about what the work was representing. So photography being something that often flattens uh, the black body, makes the, the, the body a subject, just like, like the book. And then we don't talk about the technologies that Ojekere or Seydou Keita or Melik Sugibe were using. Who were their contemporaries? What, what, what was photography doing at that time? What, what did it mean to have that technology within the spaces that they were in? How did they have to use the technology that might be different to someone in North America? What did access look like? What were innovations that they were using to develop film? Or what was what was they what were they doing that everyone else was doing? You know, like really placing them within the within the discourse of technology and of, of just the uh, trajectory of, of making. Um, I'm going to share my screen now um, and uh, then maybe just go to uh, the slides, um, but here we are, you know, the, the traditional hairstyles of, of black women and the publication actually has 50 hairstyles in it. It's such a slim book, but it has 50 images of, you know, all these different hairstyles. And the text at the beginning of the book talks about, you know, the, the, the ever sort of the promising, the promise of infinite possibilities there's so many different kinds of hairstyles that can happen. There's a, a, a quote in the, first, um, in the first page, which talks about using this book as a source book for inspiration. If you want to you know, braid and you could take uh, two styles and combine them to make something new. The book also talks about um, uh, place and space, the naming of hairstyles, that hairstyles um, take on, you know, just like the lexicon of terms around hair, is also about who's in the space, uh, what's happening around them, and what are they using those hairstyles to kind of mark in terms of events or uh, objects that live in the world or relationships or status. And um, all of those things were just so important to me in terms of thinking through how to articulate uh, what was what I wanted as a practice, a very deep practice, which was focusing on black technology, on, uh, you know, what, 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 you know, we kind of relegate these things to material culture, but you know, taking what what people look at through the framework of material culture, bring it into the realm of a conversation around technology, process, really looking at process, looking at materiality, but always considering context and considering a whole trajectory that that exposes us to the complexity and sophistication of these practices, regardless of how far back they go, and acknowledging how they've influenced what we have been doing what everyone's been doing because colonialism is a process through which uh, you know other cultures were able to benefit from the knowledge that black peoples you know and people in the global south had 
you know, this is not, it was not just an extraction of bodies, it was also an extraction of the knowledge that those bodies had, you know, and, and that labor, that labor was not uh, being produced as robots that were programmed, that labor was being produced by people who had sophisticated cultures that were bringing th that level of sophistication into the, into the work that they were being tasked for. So this publication, you know, I, I think Kojo, we also talked about this last time, where this, uh, where for the first time I'm seeing like the black body as a text, you know, as well, like not necessarily as a subject, but as something that is full and rich in within the presence, you know, the, the kind of visual presence that there is so, there are so many layers, you know, I saw for the first time, the capacity for me to unlock, you know, to, to kind of subvert that flattening that I felt the book was always doing, framing, framing, uh, cropping down, whittling down, or, or looking at, at, at blackness from a particular uh, space. And I guess also because of who is making this book, but this is one of the most powerful and meaningful images for me that has reshaped my practice. It also helped me to understand that to, be, to think about publication does not mean <laughs> to, that I have to be a typographer. I think in the way that uh, design is taught uh, in the academy, there's a, there's, there is an emphasis on typography as kind of the highest form of, uh, of sophistication uh, with design practice. And thinking about other kinds of visual languages, think about other kinds of things that can be presented within the spread of the book and that those things are meaningful and not just ornament or that there is depth to ornamentation, to decoration, um, you know, instead of like a, a, a feeling that is frivolous or, or overly indulgent, you know. For me, especially something like this hairstyle, there is so much depth and meaning, you know, encapsulated here and, and an opening to more possibilities because you see this and you think about so many other, you know, what else could be next. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think um, part of what you sketch out is this, is this opening up of what a book can be and the relation of image to the page, to the entire, um, the entire social intelligence that a photographer who engages with the sociality of style brings when that photographer embarks on the publication. So they bring a kind of photographic um, engagement, which then changes the form of the book. It puts pressure on the book so that that the um what you what you describe the um the way in which the book acts as an isolating and insulating device, which decontextualizes and as if the condition for entering into the book is to be severed from the generative ecology that generated the images to begin with. So the book itself is the extractive device. The book extracts the hairstyles from the generative ecology of women's art, women's craft, women's labor that produced the hairstyles to begin with. And the book, effectively reduces that ecology to image. But part of what I hear you saying is that this book kind of um, alluded to or opened up a generative method of working with images and design that allowed you to see the hairstyle as more than an image. The hairstyle is an ongoing generative practice, a practice whose social intelligence is inseparable from its artistic sophistication, which is inseparable from its entire, its entire generative processing. That's to say the entire an entire Ghanaian, a specifically Ghanaian, specifically regional Ghanaian aesthetics is um, astonishingly and quite 
you know, actually quite a, it's quite rare that that entire process is brought into the books so that the extractive technology of the book is overwhelmed by the generativity that is brought to play on it, which doesn't mean the book is, that doesn't, that's not even visual. It's not the book, it's not that the book is crowded. It's that he finds a way to draw out and to, he finds a way to preserve and sustain this generative ecology of practices such that you can effectively encounter the book decades later and reread the book and pick up from the book all kinds of hints and allusions which will then begin to work in tandem with what it is you want from design to begin with so that you are both working in and against the notion of the book and you're working in and against design and you're working in and against photography and you can position yourself at the nexus of all of these you can be inside of them but you can do something that is not constrained by them in other words there's something unbinding about there's something about there's something unbinding about this about the book there's something permissive about this project I think which something... then gives you the capacities to create a new set of rules with which to do the work you want to do. And so like this project, for example. So something that's really powerful about this publication, which really inspired uh, the this type specimen uh, project that I'm uh, that I've seen now, and I'll show it in, in another uh, format uh, in a bit. But something that's really powerful about the traditional hairstyles for Black women is that there are only two pages of text on those pages, it is text only, and the rest of the book is image only, no captions. So, so that means the, the, the pages of the book are free, all the, those images, those hairstyles, and those women are free from becoming didactic illustrations. You know, There's no name of any hairstyle, but the essay talks about a plethora of names and, uh, and, and, uh, and a, a nuance in naming because of place and space, and community and an evening. So, so when you are reading the book, you are looking at these images, you're reading the, the images as texts, and you are having to interpret because of what you are bringing to this publication. You kind of have to step into this. You are not told what stage the hairstyle is at, you know, but you see some people braiding. You are seeing women wearing these amazing fly sunglasses, and then you're seeing a bunch of girls with the same hairstyle which makes you think, oh, maybe they're going to some you know, traditional ceremony, maybe it's like a codified hairstyle. But then on the next page, you're seeing a woman with like big hoop earrings. And then, you know, like, it's just really wonderful production and kind of different use values are all presented, but without labeling and naming. So you have to bring the context, you have to fill in, you have to start reading all kinds of other things. And also the styles then are free up you're not labeling them, so you just get to enjoy the intricacy, the actual, you know, visual landscape, the texture, the pattern, you know, such elaborate, beautiful work, you know, and I, I feel we've seen images that are like this, but because of that caption that's next to it, because of the explanation, because of telling us these women are from this tribe, this photograph was taken at this time. There's a, there's a way that it, it traps the image and we just see it as an illustration of, of that thing. And, and it's maybe a place where it becomes something where when we think about that place, that time and that people group, that becomes the kind of holding image instead of us being able to think in this way of all of these possibilities all at once. Yeah, that's super important. Um, there is no caption, therefore there is no, um, what uh, semiotics calls anchorage. Mm -hmm. The image is not anchored by a caption which is anchored to geography or to date or to ethnography. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so the book, the images uh, start to move. The images in a way have already moved from 
a certain colonial order of naming mm -hmm. and knowledge. And in the space that opens up, there's a, a kind of um, an opening of a, in, an opening of an image of the possibilities of what an image can do, what it might do, what the indexicality of that image can do. But then what's fascinating is how um, the practice you embark on is not an eclectic, anarchistic, free for all practice. On the contrary, it's one in which you pursue the, the emergent possibilities of rules and of constraints. So can you talk a bit about that movement between possibility opening up and then binding possibility within rules and constraints that you choose in order to make the possibility work for you? So definitely, you know, this idea of uh, constraint is, is important and we're going to kind of go maybe to, to here. And, uh, you know, with thinking about grading, you know, if you, if you break it down to uh, the process, there are only three instructions that you need to continue making that phone roll or making that, you know, um, you know, separate uh, uh, grade if you're putting extensions or doing single uh, grades. But there's, there's, there are three rules that you have to follow and you have to follow them in sequence for you to be able to make the image and you have to keep repeating them for you to com complete or to be able to uh, have the promise of all that can be produced with that small system. So there's, there's something about systems baked into this way of making. And I, and I find that uh, so much of, uh, that you know within um, sort of black uh, aesthetics, black artistic production has this kind of um, almost like algorithmic uh, part to it, where there is like an underlying knowledge, there's an underlying structure, an understanding of how to work with figure and ground, understanding of, of of the of the process, a very strict kind of process, but that strict process allows for the opening up of the of the possibilities. It's it, it's needing it's kind of like yeah, I, I just found that there is this way to kind of, you know, to, that I need to play between these things. Also thinking about order, order and beauty, a, a, a relationship between order and beauty is maybe also there. Um, and not that that's the only uh, way to achieve beauty, but, you know, this is one of the instances where I feel that relationship is at play. Um, and so, you know, thinking through a module that or a, a, a closed system that can keep more, you know, can then open up to other things is kind of where it's a lot of the work uh, resides. Also thinking about motif, repetition of motif and pattern. That pattern is rule-based. Pattern is, has the, the level of sophistication in pattern is because of all of the rules and what those rules and understanding different ways to think about repetition or understanding what kind of module to produce so that you can get a different kind of uh, overall image. It's just like a, a very interesting way that you have to calculate these things for the, you know, for that beautiful end. Um, so that's what I can say about that. And so what are we seeing here and how does it relate to where we came from? from so couldn't they, from, couldn't they, from the traditional aesthetics book, to the images of the, the girls, the collage you just showed us, and then to this. How did you get from the collage to, the, to this, um, uh, this modular overall total so, pattern? When I, uh, so with the, the, um, that publication, I started to just, you know, extract, I started to extract the images of particular women as modules, as things that I could continue to use in different ways. Also realizing that many women were photographed uh, more than once, so some of them appear in that grid. So the grid is, is implied in the book, you know, and uh, not in the same way as we think about grid systems for publication layout, but you know, but the grid is there and uh, maybe, maybe there is a connection. Um, and so here again, thinking about the fold as, you know, as, as something that reinforces a grid, 
thinking about the grid as something that allows us to think about distributing something over a sequence. Um, the type specimen sheet really just opened that up for me. Um, also here, I don't think I spoke about this um, kind of thinking about speech, speech patterns and, and kind of that had, to, I was thinking about, you know, that are so specific to back home and thinking about these images. This is a type specimen sheet, which is supposed to foreground the, um, it's supposed to foreground the drawing of the letter forms. Like I, I drew this, these letter forms based on a research project around colonial Bibles. Um, but then instead of typesetting a long piece of text, which is supposed to show off the, the, uh, what you have done, the work that you've done to make this all the space and write, foregrounding the image, you know, and really also kind of enjoying the hairstyles um, and thinking about context and sound and, and speech pattern led me to think about other kinds of modules, led me to think about, um, you know, how else I could think about the grid. You know, I, I, I really have um, been thinking a lot about surface covering and so how to, how to cover a large surface, you know, what is the module that you can take to repeat and make these kind of seamless, uh, you know, seamlessly repeating um, images. I also thought about images in the book which had like dense, you know, dense spaces, densely kind of images where there was a density of bodies, you know, they're thinking about community in the township, in the city, what that meant. And I kind of was missing that, you know, density of black bodies around me or those, the sounds, you know, so, um, I started to make these kind of collages, which made me think a lot about other kinds of ways to think about pattern and then reducing what was the what was the kind of module I could make if I edited out, you know, the image of the figure, what else could stand in for the figure, or what else could what else could get me to you know, what, what, what could I do to kind of um find that module that I could use to keep repeating and making all these, you know, infinite possibilities. And so this, uh, you know, initially was um, a project that was supposed to be wallpaper, but I, I I'm, I'm not really, I haven't, at that time I wasn't interested in, in the wall as a place to put work. I wanted something that could be integrated into a space. So just you know, kind of like a naive rebellion against the wall goes straight onto the floor. But I also think a lot about the ways we move through space as black, people and especially myself, a black woman who's an immigrant in the United States who's from Zimbabwe, my traveling back and forth between these different spaces. The aerial perspective is a very important, uh, you know, mode of seeing. Um, and so I was thinking about how do I talk, how do I speak to that or how do I think about well, the, the surface of the ground and just, you know, not wanting to work on the wall, but um, this, uh, these modules also gave birth to symbols, to letter forms that continue to occupy my head space. Um, thinking about what this sort of put of a concentric circle, the straight module offer as uh, potential uh, form making tools. Um, and so I guess also, I, don't, um, I guess uh, maybe when I'm making the work, you know, I'm thinking about the resulting image but also that each image that I produce can be built back into a library that allows me to make other kinds of work. So it continues to be kind of uh, generative in that way. And, you know, maybe there isn't a, a, uh, a like direct one, like a um, line of thinking between the book and the patterns, but that's, you know, for me, that's, uh, those are the relationships. So those modules, they, um... They, they compact and condense mm -hmm. a lot of the, a lot of um, what you call that, um, the density of bodies together on the wall. Mm -hmm. That kind of, um, that what I call a, 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 an intense sociality of bodies together. Mm -hmm. um, this is a way of compressing that even more. Uh, and then, because what you've done is take a, a concentric, a quarter concentric circle of braiding mm -hmm. and then combined it with others to make, to make um, hairstyle patterns that have left the body and are starting to, starting to move 
and starting to spread and start to take on um, this generative mobility, the mobility they already had, but they are starting to um, cross the borders of media. So then, and then you get two things, you get interdisciplinarity, and then you get interscalarity. Mm -hmm. So the module is what allows you to move across media and what allows you to move across the scales that go with media. And so you start to get this, things start to like spread out. There's a sense that they're leaving. They, uh, they're leaving the body that they bring with them. That, that's kind of, that's the only way I can put it. That yeah. sounds a paradox, but you know what I mean. But no, I, 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 I know exactly what you mean. And in a way, it's almost as if reducing uh, the work down to something that feels, well, it feels like a, a, a reduction, right? You don't have all the tonality and detail of, that a photographic image gives us or, or, or promises. But this kind of flattening, it's to, um, you know, uh, just um, to, to flat color to a vector image seems as if it would reduce the meaning, but it actually opens it up because it allows the image of braiding, the, this thing that is so tied to blackness to actually go where the body has, cannot go because there's so many implications on seeing the black body that kind of constrain the meaning, right? So I feel like the fact that I've reduced the, the this work, this work of reduction actually allows for the opening up for then the image to speak to the extent that it needs to, to describe the condition, the spaces that we occupy, the spaces that we travel through, the kind of plethora of versions, cultures, articulations, and also kind of like taking the body away, uh, yeah, releases the work from some of those very didactic conversations about, um, you know, the politics of hair or identity and allows then for the mathematical kind of to really just be, you know, to, to be the stuff. You know, which I think is also kind of interesting, the mathematical, the kind of articulation of language. Um, even when we think about when language and alphabet is, um, is a system of characters that are assigned sounds that when they're strung together, make meaning. And so for me, I kind of feel that these modules do that, right? They kind of, they are interdependent. They depend on each other to be meaning building. They articulate something, some hinge towards language, but need each other. You know, they're made to connect. Um, and, and to make something larger than themselves. Oh, yes. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Um, they clearly allow, you know, a uh, kind of versioning, the versioning that you get in reggae, where you will get, you know, 269 versions of Under Me Slanting by Wayne Smith <laughs> in 1982. And there, at that point, you see music is far ahead of, of a book because there is no book yet that analyzes those 286 versions of Underneath Langton by Wayne Smith. Why isn't there? Because music moves faster because it had this modularity under the conditions of Jamaican music. But the other element which I find is um, the mathematics of black life, the mathematics of a black female practice. Something happens when you separate out blackness from black people, you know, Fred Moten says that black people have a privileged relation to blackness, but they are not the owners of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mainly because we didn't invent it. <laughs> the vast amount of it was invented in a, in a, in a library in, in West Germany somewhere. And then some of it was invented in a post office in Lagos. Some <laughs> of it was invented in a, uh, in a basement in Copenhagen, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we, we have a privileged relation to it, but we are not the owners of it. And he also says that anybody is welcome to blackness as long as they allow it to claim them. Yes, yes, you know? yes. And, uh, but, you, you, but there is a typical conflation between blackness and black people, a continuous conflation. And part of the maybe why you know, artists have turned to abstraction recently is because with abstraction, you begin to see this, you begin to see and think through this distinction 
between blackness and black people. You begin to see they're not inherently the same thing. Yeah. Really, you know, they never were. Um, and ab abstraction allows that. Like as soon as you move the braiding away from this or that particular person, this or that particular woman, you begin to see what is like the ongoingness of blackness and the, the huge um, social energy required to keep it going mm -hmm. and the, also the social energy required to contain it. So it's as if it's blackness unbound from black people. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so pleasurable to be in its company. And that's why I think a lot of, I think it's only very recently that people have begun to formulate a vocabulary for the generativity of blackness as mathematics, as iteration, as process, as dynamics. Because for so long people thought blackness is black people and black people are black bodies. But actually those three things can all be, can all be teased apart. And when we do that, then certain things open up for thought. And that's part of what happens when you're in the presence of this. So um, that's part of what is so compelling about this work. Maybe um, you could, we could see the, the, um, the moving image clip that you had from the manufacturing process. And you could talk a bit about the, as you were saying, the question of the tool, the question of digital manufacture in relation to hand, hand in relation yeah. to kind of the hand and the tool, yeah. it's an important part of what happens when blackness starts to, in a way, yeah, be unbound and uncoupled from the body that is supposed to contain it, but never did. Definitely. Um, so I don't know if you can hear me well over this, but maybe I'll just let it play and then I'll talk. So this image for me is very important because of all the mapping of the coordinates. Um, also the grid is reinforced, all these different points, you know, that live in this grid that we can't see, but is there is, is what supports the, the you know, ability for all these different machines to understand where everything is, um, you know, plotting all these X and Y, um, in ax everything plotted against an X and Y axis. Um, but also, you know, we're talking about um, this kind of moving between like, you know, uh, different mediums. We're talking about move black bodies that move between spaces. We're talking about moving between ways of articulating. Um, I, 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 this uh, drawing is so powerful for me. Also all these different lines that connect. I didn't make this, <laughs> you know, the, the drawing. I didn't put that black, that, that uh, 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 blue background. I didn't put any of those pink and red lines, orange lines, white lines that are appearing, but this is all, information that the graphic has, you know. I think that's also kind of interesting about the work that, you know, Koja is just saying it opens up these possibilities as it is reduced, as it escapes the body. But it also means that there's information in there that people are reading at different levels. And actually some people can't read the things. They just, they don't have the tools, they don't have the experience, they don't have the lens to get some of the content. So when I when I think about the work, I'm also thinking about what is what is baked into this that particular eyes experiences can read. But also, you know, for me, it's very important to think about the tools I'm using. What you know, thinking about making work as a manufacturing process as well. Uh, thinking about production: is it an additive process? Is it a, is it a um, reductive process? And thinking about the digital, you know. Oftentimes, black practices are left out of, uh, you know, conversations around digital design and fabrication, left out of conversations around technology because there's no computer plugged in. There's nothing with electricity that that made it work. But 
you know, technology does not begin with electricity and does not end with, you know, the, the screen or with some, with a robot. But I do think that there are ways that a lot of um, our sensibilities kind of um, relate, you know, there's a lot of things that kind of uh, have a relationship, you know, no matter when they were made or what they're made with. And so if they, if they have that sensibility, what does it mean to push uh, those images through those production processes, kind of conflating them, bringing them together? And so I, I really enjoy uh, working with different tools. As I'm making my work, I'm using the work to learn about the tool. So I didn't know how to use a CNC router before, but I could imagine that if I can screen print that graphic, if it's all positive and negative, if I if I've cut stencils myself to produce these elements, I could use another tool. And and with within every culture, we use we generate new tools to make our work more efficient, or to 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 extend what a practice is. And so you know, for me, I'm also thinking through uh, these uh, things. Sometimes I think about like a prosthetic arm, designing a prosthetic arm that would actually be the 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 thing that does the braiding, you know, because I, I, as I'm making this work, I'm also learning about braiding. I braid my own hair. Um, I run braiding workshops. And I think that, you know, the actual technical, you know, I'm interested in the technical. So this is exploring the technical. The braiding of my own hair is something that's highly technical, practice-based, rule-based, um, you know, you have to really understand the process. I'm really interested in, in process. Um, not just using things like CNC routers, but also, you know, screen printing, laser cutting, embroidery, sewing, you know, all kinds of things, casting, um, mold making. These are two CNC routers in, uh, the, in the university. It's very hard to get to use these machines because I'm not in the department, but I managed to run both of them at the same time for eight hours. <laughs> and, you know, it was just like really beautiful to hear the machines singing and cutting these, you know, well, braiding as well is a uh, high, is really intense, laborious, time consuming process. And so as I'm working, I also want that to be built into the work. Design is, 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 is um, uh, uh, can produce outcomes that can be spat out of machines so quickly, you know, you can print books. You, if you see books being printed, you know, on huge presses, it's like big sheets of paper going, color being layered, it's kind of mystifying, you know? And sometimes I'm like, yeah, I also want the, the image making to take time because not necessarily because of layering but because of the kind of process the the, the tool what's inherent in, in the tool there's so much information that needs to be read there's uh, it takes a lot of time to unpack there's depth that has to be uh, reproduced so this idea of cutting uh, and uh, you know this kind of interesting to me so yeah. I, I i produced these uh, wood blocks um to then eventually use uh on uh van der Koek Press, you know, I'm also interested in just so many different kinds of printing processes. So uh, also thinking about, you know, very traditional uh, printmaking and, 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 and. Fantastic. That's amazing to see that. Um, but I'm, I'm just still thinking about your, your idea of a prosthetic arm that does braiding. That's, <laughs> that's, mean, that's, that's got to be your next, that's got to be one of your next projects. I mean, it's, it's actually so interesting to see these kind of tools moving. So it's like, yeah, we can fabricate like this, you know, what we can use it for so many things. Why can't we have that in the hair salon, you know? <laughs> like, yeah, totally. Your hood that you put that hood on, like the dryer hood, and then it's like going away and done. This will be a project for me and Ayo. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Ayo will help me. Ayo should tell you, yeah, you and the <laughs> repository, and I think you should get everybody involved because clearly the the rule-based nature of braiding will suit a robotic arm. Okay. They, they okay. will go together like bread and butter. I mean, they will just fit together like that's what they were built for. It won't be a, like a stress. We have machines that we, you know, computation is, you know, based on thread and weaving and all of this stuff. I feel like there's a yeah. wonderful... Part of, to me, part of what you've done is to, as you say, so many apps there are so many ongoing african systems aesthetics from all over the continent from all points of the continent north south center west east and part of what you part of part of the project has been to 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 isolate and filter 
moments from those system aesthetics. Then, and then effectively um, speculatively draw out one of the possible vectors by connecting them to these kinds of technologies that you 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 plugged into through your institutional affiliations, mm -hmm. which then means we can then see what happens, the kind of technological possibilities of what happens when you begin to automate African system system aesthetics. When you so African systems aesthetics are already technological. Mm -hmm. They are already algorithmically processed. When they are then intensified by machinic processes, by certain digital processes, then you get what you get is um is a speculative forking and branching. You don't get linearity. You get you get the speculative branches of an evolutionary process. I think the the the, the pulling back because part of your project is to go in close and then to pull back. Part of what I think you're doing is working on the, the evolutionary possibilities of what happens to African systems aesthetics when they are allowed to become generatively capacious. Mm -hmm. And then you get things like this, which are so, it's so beautiful to see what you're doing here. <laughs> my cheesy videos <laughs> yeah but you should be proud because they are they're amazing and it's also what happens it's like oh my god look at look at what happens to a system when you let it drive the process that's that's what you see and that's that's what's so compelling about it because then retrospectively you begun you begin to see how contained these systems have been how they've been extracted captured contained and policed and disciplined. You yeah. begin to see it once you give them their speculative capacity for evolution. You I begin see. to see how they've been inhibited, underdeveloped, and effectively de-evolved. And I think also part of that is who was given the opportunity to be at the, to, to move the parts of the machine, right? So you don't only see content that's been left out, you actually see uh, practitioners that have been left out because what would have happened if there were more press men who weren't just like uh, doing the bidding of whoever, you know, of, of um, whoever wanted this publication to be produced, you know, like if we go back in the day and think about the evolution of, of print making and printing practices, black people were in those spaces, but they were doing things in a very manual technical way and not necessarily being involved in being you know creating or even running the space but what if we were at the helm what if we were the ones who could decide on all of these things what would images be so who who has the option to be at the you know to actually turn turn that machine who has the means of production and what would they do if they had those kind of things or, or where are you in the process and how do you have control about what then gets viewed what gets reproduced what gets seen as technology, what gets seen as information, or what information looks like. That's, um, such, a, that's such a profound series of questions, because the, even the, the temporality in which you pose those questions is, a, is the subjunctive, like what would have happened, what could have happened, if, what might have happened. It reminds me so much of a conversation I had with Arthur Jaffe years ago, and he would say things like, what if, what if you put a camera in the Kenyan savannah 900 years ago, like speculatively speaking, what if the camera had been developed in East Africa yeah. and had been engendered by Kenyan, by specific Kenyan peoples under, under their own specific aesthetic demands? And then he said, then you have to it, then fast forward 900 years and then make work after that. Yeah. Like make work with that speculative imagination of, of a frame. So not about the content, but the demands that that technology would have had to answer to. 
Exactly. And what you just said is exactly what he said to me all those years ago. What would have happened if black peoples had the had been able to direct, been able to inform the parameters of that technology so that it answered to their preoccupations? That and then part of your part of your project is to say this is one of the versions of what might have happened. This is, so it's a kind of, it's a subjunctive evolutionary project. This is what could have and might have happened. That's part of what's so powerful about the work. It fills you with this sense of the, the subjunctive, the conditional, that the same, ten, the same temporality that Sadia Hartman uses in Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments which is all about the would and the could and the might. Mm. And, but here it is, you know, yeah, it's beautiful to see. And, and it's, um, it's why it's so moving, actually. And it really is like, a, you know, it is a study, it's a deep study on one, one um, sort of you know, one, one possibility that could be applied to so many other situations, so many other forms. And I wish I could do, you know, plenty of projects all at once, but it's been so uh, good to just like really hone in on this and push it through all of these modalities, push it through all of these machines um, and ask those questions. Because I think it also shows other people that, yeah, take, take, any, of, take any other uh, node and investigate that and, and pull that thing up and realize its value, talk about it in depth in terms of, process and, and, and with a level of sophistication and with language that you might even have to build because language has been kept away from it unless it was minimizing it or making it symbolic or make, or talking about it in terms of ritual. You know, I think even with these images, you know, the power of the photography in this uh, piece is the proximity that uh, Sunoga has to the community that allows him to document them in ways that, you know, a white photographer coming into that space would most probably pose everyone full frontal or, you know, you know like, you know, like a, a profile, you know, maybe three quarter angle. There's so many really interesting ways that he's photographed people here that you can only do if you have proximity. So also who's, you know, who's, who's got the camera and also the kind of images that are in the book, like some of these, these facial expressions are so strong, you know, these, these women are demanding <laughs> attention or they, they have some kind of relationship with him. and. Um, there's some very subtle moments as well that I just I just feel like it really matters who who is driving the machine, you know. If if we want to work to have nuance and and depth and to be rich, um, if we want some of that content that only particular individuals can kind of bring to the surface, or or that if we want it to be coded into the work so that other people who have those experiences can get those extra levels of reading. Otherwise, a lot of content. It's, you know, a lot of machines are handled by particular hands for framing other kinds of images of people and cultures. And, and then there's just like, you know, as the work is going through the machine, it's being distilled to something that becomes more and more vapid, you know, and we see that, we see that all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing what you're showing us now. Yeah, so this, uh, I think, you know, process is, is really, it it's teaches me how to think about the, the work, like doing the actual stuff. So this is vinyl that has been, this, you know, vinyl has been cut, it's for wall treatment and um, being able to get the image, you have to let the machine cut everything and then you have to pull out. And for me, it's kind of like, you know, this is like parting the hair. This is like mm -hmm. also undoing the hair. And I, and I really enjoy working with the vinyl because once you apply it to the wall, to, uh, to, you can't ever move the piece. The, the, you have to destroy the piece <laughs> to be able to like use the wall again. You can't, it's not like hanging a, a painting or a photograph and then taking it down and moving somewhere else. So all the work is really site specific. You know, I also think about that with the braiding, like you do it on the head and then you have to destroy the hair. At some point you have to destroy the hair. So actually the hairstyle becomes undone it's not, it's it's going through a process of becoming undone from the moment it's finished you know mm -hmm. it's getting worn out over time you know there's a moment where you can really see that oh damn it's time for this to come out you know but it's it's going through a process of undoing the 
from the moment it is installed. So I really like that this, um, you know, this is some of my favorite documentation. I really love it, it's so gratifying. But also then, you know, it makes you think about Figure and Brown and maybe there's a version of this where I'm actually uh, uh, putting down this negative space rather than putting down the positive of the braid. Like what does it, what makes the image, you know? Yes. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's really, that's really special. Maybe, um, do we, we play uh, Pain Revisited and then go to some questions from our guests? Because I think there's some, I think uh, there might be a few, just some thoughts from people, especially in relation to that last, to the last image you showed. But it maybe it'd be good for people to see uh, Pain Revisited and to hear it as well was the, 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 the relation to sound that is implied by the question of iteration and rule and pattern, which in a way we are familiar with from say Northern Ghanaian minimalist aesthetics. From, you know, there, the, there were many compelling arguments that what we understand as uh, New York minimalism comes through so many vectors from West African countries. So the, 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 the kind of West African aesthetic and sonic processes, different sonic process, East African sonic processes that feed into minimalism, I think are, have a resonance with your modular practice as well. images of other versions, thinking about the, the braided uh, uh, modules as dimensional images or images that cheat us into thinking about dimension, think about perception, kind of yeah. diving into like, you know, uh, the visual, how do we see what the images tell us, what information they give us, and also opening up the visual space 
why always flat? You know, why why only aerial? What about what about objects? What about dimension? What about going over surface? What about thinking about the surface? You know, fantastic. Putting a, another surface out of, uh, of of another. So, um, this what is, are these works called, Nancy? Um, this is box braids, <laughs> oh, yeah. like uh, the hairstyle. You know. Yes. Uh, um, and I, so I think about that sometimes playing with the language and uh, in very simple ways and schools, um, kind of thinking about this very established kind of um, hairstyle that we see in contemporary, you know, in our contemporary society and main, mainstay of, you know, it's also one of the kind of hairstyles that really captivated us when we were growing up because the, the, this style of braiding with extensions is not necessarily something that is uh, traditional in our community in Southern Africa. There are other cultures where there's a lot of extending of the hair using other kinds of materials and stuff, you know, even, even from a very traditional perspective. But we came to these images through watching music videos of Patra, you know, a Jamaican a dancehall artist. Lady and, Patra. Uh, Patra, she, she's like a dancehall. Yeah, <laughs> I know and, Lady Patra. And, uh, and um, then Poetic Justice, you know, the um, uh, movie with Tupac. With Tupac, and, yep. Uh, so these are the things that also influence the what we thought about black hair aesthetics, you know, the, the kind of for, formulas for black beauty or, or, or standards for black beauty. And uh, so the screen, what we saw on the screen, what the camera was doing to capture what, especially what the black American community were doing in terms of uh, pre presenting themselves. Even this, uh, this one film, um, you know, set it off with Queen Latifah. Yes. I have a whole, uh, sort of project around all the hairstyles in that uh, movie as as um, kind of, you know, they use the hairstyles to typecast different individuals. You know who's the, the more maternal, you know who's who's the, you know, butch queen, you know who's the femme, who's always like damsel in distress. They really use the hairstyles to kind of um, paint a picture of the character. So yeah. there's all of that kind of information built into the into the hairstyles. and and. Also, we know those we know those hairstyles, and we know how they figure into our community. So, if you are if you are part of the community, you kind of are also having this experience of different levels of reading as you're watching that. But also because that's what we do. We do these things. We know we're going to change our hair for this particular setting because we're going to communicate A, B, C, D, or because this is kind of expected in this kind of space, or because this is uniform and then this signs on my body that. This is who I am in relationship to this institution and, and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah, and, yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense in the kind of the the what you're talking about is those kinds of the way in which the way in which you you know way in which you school yourself in African American pop cultural aesthetics, the way in which videos provide this continual study program in which you scrutinize pop cultural aesthetics with, with an extremely differentiated gaze, the way in which these videos are like a school in themselves. Yeah, and teachers. You know, a school, in, a school of style. Exactly. And we totally, we, we copied, we reproduced them. We totally reproduced them on ourselves. You know, they became part of our landscape. Um, yeah. Let's leave this. Okay. So first, last thing, tell us about this amazing image, and then please leave it up, and then let's go to some questions because I'm sure some people have some comments. Just to, some people just would like to respond to all the things you've been showing us. But, but let's um, let's just first of all just tell us about this amazing, amazing work that we can see right in front of us. So this piece is part of a kind of ongoing, or kind of it's going to be a, a series of wall drawings that will take place in different um, communities where I have, you know, where I have community, where I have connections. Uh, so there will be a mural in Harare, there'll be a mural in the Bahamas, there'll be a mural hopefully in London. Um, my family live in the UK. It's kind of a, there'll be a mural in South Africa, country. Um, it was going to be in Cape Town, but I think we're going to do it in Johannesburg. You know, all these places that I move through and have community. Um, thinking also about work, working through relationships. Uh, my practice is, is very relational. Um, one of the projects that I didn't show, which we've talked about, um, uh, Kojo Ruka, uh, oh, yeah. 
project where I brought um, braiding workshops into an art space, you know, and uh, turned the art space into a hair salon, a braiding salon. Um, all the women around the table that attended those workshops are all practitioners, artists, curators, uh, you know, writers, um, just really thinking about where they are now and how that was so important for my practice. Also, because of uh, working in a space where there were no other voices to kind of reinforce or help to sharpen the thinking and coming to New York and then the work pulling those people towards it and them being like continue like um you know they continue to be important here so I'm kind of trying to think about relationships as a vehicle for production and for mm -hmm. the, where the work can be the work can be in particular places because it's people are there um and um but this uh, these wall drawings are kind of a way also for me to present uh the work around um lettering that i've been doing i've developed like eight different versions of these braided letter forms this this it's instance is a dimensional character set and the, there are so many variables within the character set so you can see like three different a's mm -hmm. um, four different a's you can kind of see them from different angles when you're kind of looking up at it this one is looking down on them there's capital letters, there are numbers, there are some other punctuations, and then there's also just symbols, you know. Um, and I, I think, I'm thinking again about the surface, I'm thinking about uh, drawings that can go from uh, wall to floor to ceiling. So this extension kind of wraps around, goes, goes down onto the floor, then wraps around the pillar. I, I'm thinking about drawings that kind of creep uh, around the space that we occupy, like tumbleweeds, you sometimes come across a stray braid in the road. <laughs> but um, yeah. and uh, so yeah, but I but I also like these. You know, I'm thinking about macro graphics. You know, I, mm -hmm. I mean macro graphics. And this this uh, version, this instance of the mural is much smaller than the rest will be. The characters are designed to be um, the same height as me. Like the lowercase characters are designed to be my height. And so also thinking about the monumental. You know, mm -hmm. about you know just scale taking up space kind of really covering surface and a graphic 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 sensibility as much as i'm interested in what the language does what little forms do i'm also interested in just the formal you know the form, formal aspects of this work and and it is writing you know but it is uh it is spelling out a long laugh a very very long laugh <laughs> kind of like this broke this laugh which would be broken down by these geographic borders um, and occupy formal and informal spaces. Some institutions I will be hosting are like the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. Other spaces will be a, a wall in a neighborhood in Harare. Others will be hair salon in uh, South Africa. And so, yeah, I'm, also I'm just interested in that flow, that moving through space and taking up space and very dynamic presence in a space and articulating something that really only insiders can, um, can kind of really get the laugh that is spelling out is a very particular laugh that that Zimbabwean women utter. You know, it's very particular, and uh, I like those. You know, and it's very interesting sound that way. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why. It's like things that have meaning, but they're not words, but they have more. They you can point so much language towards them. So much. Yeah. Meaning. You said it's you. It's a laugh that you and your sister share. Well, you know, it's a laugh, it's kind of, it's a laugh that, um, that, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it's, a, men would never laugh in this way. It's a laugh that women share amongst each other. Mm -hmm. It's when something really intense has happened, you know, it's like, I cannot believe that, you know, like, it's totally hilarious or it's like, actually so shocking and, and devastating. So you yeah. can only laugh. Laughter is a, a very important communication tool in, uh, Zimbabwean uh, communities. Very, yeah. very important. There's so many ways to laugh. And uh, the, the laugh kind of has, it is kind of like its own lexicon because they, they, they have particular sounds. That they, you know, they, it could be words, but it's not a word. It's a way to exclaim. You know, we have so many ways to exclaim, like that type specimen sheet is all these different exclamations. Ah, ah, eh, 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 eh. Oh, you know, it's, it's language, yeah. but it's not a word. But, and it changes depending on the context and depending on who you're saying it to. Um, yeah, it's just tonality, it's tonality. Yes. You're speaking through tonality. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a, a lexicon of tonality and uh, it's alphabetic, alphabetic furniture, you know, and it's lexical drama. It's so dramatic, yeah. so <laughs> elegant. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then it keeps all its secrets to itself, but it gives all the secrets away at the same time. It's truly exquisite and uh, don't take it off. Keep it, just keep it there. <laughs> and then in the time we have left, because of course we'd be, we can talk for hours, but there are, there are like some people who've been listening. So uh, yeah, so um, uh, dear guests, wherever you are around the planet, if you want to share some thoughts with Nancy, you want to respond to anything that Nancy has been saying. If you want to just just feedback, now's your chance. Don't be shy. We are here. Over to you. Because if you don't, we'll just keep talking. It's been amazing. Thank you so much. Really, really amazing, impressive, and. Uh... I really enjoy the spatiality of that, uh, what is uh, uh, this kind of like a spatialized uh, laughter that you put there onto the, uh, like the depth as, as if you could walk in. Mm -hmm. uh, I really like it, it's great. It reminds me a bit on uh, Shabazz palaces, in fact, mm -hmm. uh, on the, uh, you know, um, that moves between text and image, the, the writing that they use for their artworks, okay. but also like how they, like the, I have a t-shirt by Shabbos Palaces. And oh, it's like, yeah. We'll it be good like, friends. Huh? <laughs> we'll be good friends. Anyone that listens to Shabbos Palaces has got the right things going on in their mind. Ah, <laughs> uh, no. I mean, Shabbos Palaces, the last, the past learner was the song that just came out in the first lockdown. And I remember um, to share this with everyone because one of the main characters she is um, nodding in a very very elegant and reassuring way uh, mm -hmm. that we um, you know was very reassuring to listen to the past learner like continuously but I like it a lot I just wanted to say it's amazing thank you thank you so much no, I have many questions but I could close the microphone for anyone else to join in please I think most people are uh, formulating their thoughts that that idea of text that is image it, it you know that I, I i i really do like to use elements as both you know the photograph as a text the typographic form as a graphic you know as an image that you can enjoy them with in both reading spaces you know there's so many different ways to read uh, this, um, you know, some writers can give you two heartbeats. The title of the book that Tinashe and I uh, um, put out, the um, Yvonne Vera's quote is, some writers can give you two heartbeats, one for the beauty of the words, the other for the event, you know? So there's different ways of, of, of some, a piece of work hitting you, affecting you, but there's different ways to take it in. And I, I want those things to be happening simultaneously. Maybe this is part of... Uh... This is part of Nep Sidhu in his collaboration with Shabazz. Maybe he also has this through, through his calligraphic practice. Oh no, it's definitely there. It's totally Yeah, there. this is part of, that's you're that's on, that's you are on parallel paths. I hope I can be as good as him. <laughs> I have so much respect for that work and also, also the materiality that he moves the work through that is mm -hmm. going into tapestry. Yes. You know, so using all of those threads to then build up into that language. Um, he's also doing it in jewelry. He's doing it in fashion objects. Um, the highly sophisticated practice. Yes. And then the collaborations with with um, with Ishmael. So understanding the stake that sound has in a visual practice, or, or what the two can do together. You know, it's just really really profound. Yeah. Okay, participants, we can talk about, the three of us can talk about Shabazz palaces for a long time. So if you don't want to ask questions, it's fine with us. Because once we get on to talking about Ishmael Butler and Neb Sidhu and Shabazz palaces albums, we can happily go on and just ignore you altogether. 
<laughs> so if it's okay with you, we'll keep talking. But, um, you know, just to say, now is your chance to talk to Nancy, to share any thoughts you have. Anybody who, who loves, who loves the kind of, the kinds of morphogenetic, bivalent um, ideas we're talking about in which a text is an image which is a sound and a sound is an image which is a text and such that each, each element has another, each entity is simultaneously itself and something else and part of the art is in allowing that latency to emerge so that entities have a two or three lives to them. They are bivalent or trivalent. Anybody who's into that, and I would hope you are, now would be your chance. Anyone? No? Okay. I would definitely love to hear from the, from the group, but yeah. Well, I guess people are just thinking aloud or just thinking and thinking as such. But I was also, what you said just now made me think about quote looking, just like, you know, this is, this is quote switching, you know, in a way. Code that... switching, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I feel this is, um, I feel this is opening code switching out because the way people talk about code switching, switching between, um, switching between styles of speech or forms of speech, or accents, um, I feel people treat it in a very reactive way. Like you do it in reaction to a situation, you do it in response to something. I feel like code switching should be in a way, in a way if people could think of it outside of its reactive and derivative manner, like there is always, there was, there was an imposing context and then you code switch. So it's effectively a chamele chameleonic move, mm. which is effectively adaptive and protective. And I feel, there's, I feel there should be a way to think of that code switching is not only adaptive and not only reactive and not only derivative, but is generative, like it, like, what if code switching was primary, not secondary? But what if it, for me, it is. For me, it is. And I think you know, when I when I when I'm in my community, when I'm with my siblings, when I'm with my cousins or friends from back home, or even with you and Ayo, I, you know, as, I mean, this is one of the things I love about talking with Ayo because there's a different way that we are able to speak, where I don't feel like I'm just saying I'm just using words in a really basic didactic way to express what I need to say. There are so many sounds and different accents that we're using for emphasis, for, to emphasize particular things or to, you know, it, it's not about, um, yeah, it's not, a, it's not a response to a, a particular setting or to him, but it's what the communication needs for it to be its most, um, to, for it to be expressed to the extent that each thing needs to be articulated. So when I'm talking with Ayo or with my siblings, there's times where I'm putting on a fake American accent because I need to say that piece of language in that accent. And then there's a way that I'm using a very Shona accent, an accent which is using vowel sounds to say English words with the kind of tonality that I would use if I was speaking the language Shona. But I'm speaking English. But I need to say that word in that way because of what I'm trying to express in that moment about a situation or what I'm trying to describe. And then I speak in this tonality because I need to, you know, certain things to get across in a particular way because I'm trying to, you know. So it's, for me, uh, yeah, I, I think sometimes um, people who've got practices where they focus on one thing have tried to speak to me about what I'm doing and felt that I'm doing so many different things, but I don't feel the difference because I'm, I know I'm, doing, I'm trying to do one thing, I'm trying to communicate these ideas or trying to create a space for particular individuals who have this insider knowledge 
for the, the work to give them a space to be and uh, to be in, in all the ways that they can be without being framed in one flat way. And so that means I have to do something on the floor and something with sound and something on the screen and, and a GIF versus a, 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 a film, but then a film and then a print or that each of these things can live, you know, you've got pain revisited and then you've got the type specimen sheet and then you've got the wallpaper and, um, and then you have them as constellations that also need each other, that are, in, that are dependent on each other. And you see them with the tools because in relationship to each other, then they have an even stronger meaning and then they start to articulate themselves even more or start to articulate a kind of presence of a, a world or space or well, yeah then once you bring them into space you can see the morphogenetic processing that is running between and across what appear to be different mediums yeah. so this this idea that you're doing so many things makes no sense because you're you're iteratively trying you're iteratively exploring the space of possibilities of the same set of ideas yeah it's just that these ideas do not in principle have a fixed destination or a fixed direction yeah and you're exploring the the space of possibilities of where they can go and what they might go and what they could do like what if they go this way what could it look like so it's not about doing, it's not eclecticism, it's the opposite. It's, yeah. it's opening, it's, it's studying the reservoir of options available given your initial systems. You know, it's, it's system aesthetics in its most refined and thoughtful way. And it's crazy to, for people to say, well, it's people who aren't sufficiently attuned by the project itself because the project yeah. invites you into it and you learn to you learn to read it inhabit it and enjoy it if you just slow down to it and attend to it if you don't then you you might see eclecticism but that is really about what you bring to it but speaking of that um, we had a question based around the the sonic component of uh, pain revisited Mm -hmm. the, the sonic the, the the sonic aspect that that um, screen share could not really handle. But could you talk a bit about about your the, the choices behind your sonic the sonic design that you brought to that work? So the work actually started with the sound, and so we were discussing earlier on the the full length uh, video piece, which is a sonic landscape uh, designed by Diani Booz, who is a uh, a sound artist mm -hmm. and Diani is in a collective called um, oh how can I forget the, the name of the collective they do a really amazing work Jatavia Gary is in that um, is in the collective new new negress from society and oh, uh, oh yes yeah so yeah a sound technician in that group and um, what and they were doing their very first screening they just formed as a collective and they wanted everybody to have a film represented so Diani approached me to do the visual component for the film. So we collaborated and the sound is actually recorded with, from when she did study abroad at um, this university. Mm -hmm. So the students, female students at a hostel at this university at 2 a.m. chanting, you know, in a way it's kind of like what, uh, you know, in the US, I guess they've got this thing called hazing. I've never been through it. I wasn't an undergrad here. And yeah. uh, you know, they kind of, it's something between community building, resilient testing, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. kind of thing. But, you know, the, if you listen to it, it has all the mappings of like our traditional sonic scapes, like the, the way we compose traditional songs, sing together. It's almost like, you know, singing a, a Shona hymn together or like singing something in a traditional setting with a drum and all of these things, you know, and uh, all the kind of chanting that can kind of take you out of where you are and transport you to another kind of dimension. We use sound in these ways to, to transport up. And um, yeah, I, I, I really thought the density of voices, the repetition was amazing. 
also these young men saying shut up shut up stop saying it you know because they're kind of irritated <laughs> it's 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 2 a.m in the morning but i also feel like that that i wanted to make a really dense space which was impenetrable even with these individuals trying to stop the, what was going on the the you know just like this mass of women the power of a mass of women kind of moving together and not flattening them into like one thing but like understanding what all those individuals can do and the tessellating like i don't know there was this there's just so much uh, from the way that uh sound feels to me that brought me into the space of really thinking about uh, pattern with the with the with these images and, that's uh, a really good way of putting it how sound how sound brought you into the space of tessellating the space of images that tessellate upon each other i think you've you've answered in advance um uh, a, a question we have here by shay applewaite who says happy to be here thanks for this conversation i was interested in how nonzi's speculative evolution of braiding technology refuses the subject object distinction that often characterizes technology offering a way that we can abstract from ourselves into space and make worlds. I guess a question I have is how the sound of your videos intervenes in the image as a narrative device. Mm -hmm. Could you speak more on that? Yeah. Um, there's another piece that I didn't present. It's accessible through my website um, called uh, Unbreakable. Unbreakable is a djembe, has a djembe drum as the soundscape again a piece that where i started with the sound and i did, i edited that piece i mean i just did a lot of different things with the poem i just was photographing it's actually it's actually stop motion but it feels like fluid motion because of how many frames i i, I made and so i had just had a lot of stuff when i'm working i just have a lot of stuff i just make so many iterations there's i i just keep going until i you know get tired or whatever and so th that's why there's so many versions of these things i don't know what the goal is i just know i want to push something push a module and see where it can go and then the sound actually allows for a framing device a, but a very dynamic framing device which has its own arc you know uh, uh, I, I when i teach design I, I talk about music all the time i talk about the dynamism you know in the crescendo i talk about the hook i talk of you know about the Kind of um, what the beat does in terms of setting up a rhythm and what other things kind of come in to either destabilize that or to kind of move in tandem or kind of slightly you know a different kind of different music has but like a very reliable kind of system or something that kind of throws you off kilter what what does harmony offer or what does a, some a note being off or what does a flat uh, something being in a flat key do you know i think about music a lot i i i, I um I play clarinet and piano and guitar, and I've played in orchestras. So not as a, I'm not very really advanced in clarinet, you know, but I I played third orchestra, third, third clarinet in an orchestra, but that was very formative. Again, it was I like to learn tools, I like to learn instruments, so that follows through in the different kind of work I do, even publication design, and and I don't think I'm even answering the. the I'm so sorry if I'm not answering your question anymore, but <laughs> uh, publication design for me is not because I know all about it and uh, know about publication uh, production. I, I enter into something wanting to, wanting to learn the mechanisms. And so I get my training through the doing of it, you know, through, the, 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 through going through the technical process. And then I don't know if I ever master something, but I get to understand it. And I'm not afraid to put the thing out. But I guess to go back, to your question about the, the sound, it is that it offers me a, a, a framework which has a very dynamic arc and has kind of like a, it kind of gives me the limits because I can go and go and go. It tells me where the space I have uh, to work in and, and uh, allows me to push some of the dense things into that space and some of the quieter things into that moment and some of the whatever. And, and it gives me the pace and rhythm because otherwise I will make, I, I have versions and versions of everything, you know. I don't know how many a small uh, lowercase a's I have. Every time I open the file, I can see another way that it can be built. So 
that kind of anchoring device, sound for me is an anchoring device. Yeah. Sound allows you to shape and filter yeah. the space of possibilities. Yeah. It helps me to edit. It helps me to edit. Because without that, you, the space of possibilities will fill up with op possibilities and could you keep going and going, but you have to shape them at some yeah. point. Well, you don't have to shape them, but it's more like what happens if you do. Yeah. I guess also, you know, when I'm working with video, video, I feel like it does it. It's not the same as, um, yeah, you've got the screen, right? But the screen is kind of like a space, which is not a surface. It doesn't feel like a surface to me. So like the wall is a surface, a ground that has its limits and it tells me what I can, how I can push into it or not or whatever. And I feel like maybe the sound, not maybe, the sound is working in that way for me. It is, it is a ground, it becomes a ground for me. It becomes yeah. a surface for me to work on. It's not yeah. necessarily, it's not, I'm not doing it like I'm integrating the sound in. No, I'm starting with it. Like I'm starting with a piece of paper that I would screen print on. That makes so much sense to me. It really does. Okay, well, uh, if there are no more questions, I think we're going to we're going to wind down our conversation. Shay Applewhite says thank you with three exclamation marks. <laughs> so that's a big thank you for your response. So um, are there? If there are no more questions, we're going to wind down our conversation, which um, you know clearly we'll con with if everything goes well we'll be able to continue our conversation uh here or in other settings for years to come hopefully um because uh there's a lot more to say and there are many things we didn't get to see but that's okay because i don't believe in saying everything straight away that way lies disaster so um i'll just uh thank nancy for her time and her patience with the endless back and forth of emails, um, but mostly for sharing her thinking, her practice, her process and her research with us here at CCC. Um, I would like to thank Naim Saku, of course, Doreen, and most of all, everybody joining in and uh, tuning in to our conversation from all over the world. Um, our next event will be in March, I believe, with IAPA Repository, who are comrades and uh, fellow travellers of Nancy, who um, Nancy very much introduced me to, um, two amazing artists, Ayo and Salome, based in New York. Um, that's a bit of a way off, though. Um, but uh, in the meantime, Doreen's made a point, which is, you know, instead of uh, all going out for a drink, just go to YouTube and watch Shabazz Palaces instead. Watch Fast Learner, because uh, we are, we bonded over our love of Shabazz Palaces. And frankly, if you don't love Shabazz Palaces, there's no hope for you. I mean, they're only one of the greatest groups who ever lived. Oh my God. It's Doreen Shabazz yeah. Palace's t shirt. I have, uh, just outside my living room, I have a wall which has, by, um, you know, records, Shabazz Palace's records. The only records I have are Shabazz Palace's and Grace Jones. That's all. <sighs> what else do you need? No, nothing else. Nothing you don't else. need anything else. That's good enough for me. Yeah. I mean, also their collaborations with Khalil Joseph. And just the way they think exactly. about the visual space, you know, all the animations that are built around the work and things, really gorgeous. Uh, uh, Ishmael's video for, I think it's the, 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 the is it the chocolate, chocolate souffle? He's got a track called Chocolate Souffle on the latest album. Is all, I think it's all shot on his cell phone in a way which is like the least cheesy thing I've ever seen done with a cell phone. I'm just like, how do you get that much out of the, the phone, you know, like, or, or thinking about the vertical space of video? I, yeah, they really get a lot out of everything because they understand an integrated practice, you know, because when Ishmael is making music, all of Black Constellation is also being considered, you know, what, you know, and the garments and all of these things, 
yeah, I mean, just a highly sophisticated, really wonderful integrated practice they have. I couldn't agree more. Um, if everything goes well, we will try to um, either have Nepsidu or Khalil Joseph uh, as part of this uh, program next year. It's Who knows if that's going to be possible, but we're certainly going to try. Yes. Um, I, I'll, uh, I'll help you nudge. I'll help you nudge. Yes. Yeah. But until then, Nancy, thank you so much for showing us your great, great work. And um, I think we're going to call a temporary halt to our conversation, Wonderful. which seems to have gone like a, seems to have gone in no time at all. I know. I know. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I hope that we can connect in other ways. I'm available on email if people want to chat about things. And um, who knows where the world will take us. I might end up in Sweden. I'll be in Germany soon. If we are able to travel, we might see each other sooner than later. But Hopefully. Yeah you'll be able to enjoy your fellowship, your DAAD fellowship. I will enjoy it even if I'm locked in the studio because I'll have all my toys and just time to do that. You know, I really want to invest in production. And yeah. so it'll be fine. Of course, people are important, but um, we might have to form a pod, Kojo. Uh, um, <laughs> we might have to form our own little pod so I can see you. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for being so attentive. And the program sounds really interesting i'm going to try to learn more about it thank you once again and good night everybody thanks for your time